Dudes and dudettes and everything in between, welcome back to the James Kennedy Podcast episode, whatever it is, I don't even know anymore. How are you? Are you good? Are you awesome, man? I'm a little bit excited today because about 15 years ago, it must have been, maybe even longer, I read a book called Web of Deceit, which absolutely changed my life. I knew governments were fucked up and corrupt and criminal, but I had no idea the scale of it until I read this book. Global in scope, meticulous in research, and completely backed up with evidence and documentation from official records throughout the entire book. So this is no conspiracy David Icke bullshit. This is actual investigative journalism at its best. Written by a guy called Mark Curtis. Now, some of you know I'm a massive fan of Noam Chomsky. Any chance I get to quote Chomsky, I'm there. Now, Noam Chomsky, I think, is the most quoted living person on earth or something like that. I think it goes the Bible, Shakespeare, Chomsky. (laughs) The dude's like 95 and he's still kicking ass, right? Now, Noam Chomsky says of Mark Curtis that he he has a contribution of the highest significance. He said a lot about this stuff as well, like scrupulously, relentlessly recues the historical and documentary record from a web of distortion and self-serving illusion. I just read that really fast from the cover of the book, Web of Deceit. Now, when Chomsky says that about you, you know you're a heavy hitter. But that's not all, because the journalist's journalist, Mr. John Pilger, has also described the author of Web of Deceit, the country's best and most radical popular historian. Now, he also said a ton of other stuff about Mark Curtis, which I'm not going to read off, um, because I think you get the gist. Basically, John Pilger and Noam Chomsky are the dudes. They're giants. And in the world of investigative journalism, when they come singing your praises, it doesn't get any higher than that. So as a massive nerdy fanboy of all of the three people I just mentioned, it is my absolute honor to have with us on the podcast today, the one and only Mr. Mark Curtis. An investigative journalist and author of the highest esteem, his books, Web of Deceit, Unpeople and Secret Affairs, are essential reading. This is journalism and reporting at its absolute finest. I got a ton of things I want to get into with Mark today, and I'm so privileged to be able to have this conversation with him, and I really, really hope you enjoy listening and joining us for the ride. I know this is going to be informative, insightful, and mind-blowing for all of us. So without further ado, Mark Curtis, thank you so much for your time and being with us today. How the hell are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, and thanks very much for inviting me. Very, very happy to talk to you, James. Oh, well, anytime. Thank you, Mark. We're going to be very happy to listen to you, mate. (laughs) Um, So as I said, I'm already a fully signed up Mark Curtis fanboy. But for those listeners who aren't yet exposed to your work and aren't yet in the Mark Curtis fan club, uh, what would be a quick 101 just to set the stage here for um, the conversation to follow about who you are, what it is that you do and what is the nature of the work that you do? As far as I'm aware, I, I know of you as a best-selling author and investigative journalist and also a media outlet owner uh, with Declassified UK. Uh, obviously, we're going to discuss all of that stuff. But do you do other stuff as well that I don't know about on top of all that awesome stuff? No, I mean, I, you know, for quite a long time now, more, more years than I care to admit, probably, I've been a, an independent researcher and writer about Britain's role in the world. And, and, and I guess what I've tried to do is tell the truth about what UK governments actually do around the world, which, you know, immediately puts me in contrast, I think, to the the way that the corporate media fails to uncover um, the the UK's real role in the world. So the sort of things that I've done is, I mean, you know, I've written several books based on the uh, declassified British files, um, you know, the statements and position papers and the the correspondence of, of, of government officials trying to reveal what they really want in, in places around the world. And then in the last couple of years, I've, I've set up an organization with a journalist colleague of mine called Matt Kennard, an organization called Declassified UK, which also seeks to tell the truth about the UK. Um, and we write articles and conduct investigations, trying to perform a public service, trying to tell people what the UK's real role, real role in the world is. And you know, if I was to try and summarize that, I would say that Britain is basically a rogue state, um, a routine violator of international law, a supporter of numerous progress, uh, repressive regimes and, and dictatorships, and in effect, a warmonger, you know, a country that regularly goes to war um, and 
I, I think that the British public has been kept in the dark. They've, they've been sold a lie. What, what they've been told is that the, our governments act in our interests and promote peace, democracy, and human rights around the world. And, and, and that is plainly not true. And I, I see my role and the role of Declassified Now with, with the other journalists that we have to, to tell the truth and to play, to play a public service, informing people what actually is being done in their name, rather than what they see on the BBC or read in their, in their newspapers. Well, I know for some people listening to this already, you will have made quite a few controversial claims there to suggest that Britain is a rogue state and a supporter of terrorism. And obviously, I know that you can back up everything that you say with steel hard evidence. But for people who are kind of new to this, what would be some current conflicts happening right now around the world that you could use to illustrate the point that you're making about Britain's real role in the world? Yeah, I mean, there's there, there's a lot. I mean, there's you know, there's a lot of historical um, episodes that we can look at in Britain's foreign policy that you know, some of which have never been mentioned in in media or on television, and that people won't know about, um, which I've tried to document in my books. Um, if if we if we take the current situation, I mean, a, a very good example I think is to compare the coverage, say the media coverage of uh, the Russian war in Ukraine with the UK's war in Yemen. Yes. I mean, you know, Yemen is the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe. 20 million people are in need of assistance, according to the UN. There's, there's mass starvation. There's been a war going on in Yemen since 2015, um, where the Saudi Air Force has been bombing the country with British uh, support, uh, with British advice, Pilots trained by the UK, armed by the UK, diplomatically supported by the UK, with RAF senior personnel advising the Saudis on their airstrikes. Massive co- commitment of uh, war crimes, thousands of attacks on civilian targets, schools, hospitals, you know, in Yemen for seven years. It's a British war. Um, that that conflict has received actually very little coverage in the media. Um, certainly compared to you know what's now going on in in Ukraine, um, and and it, it's illustrative of of how British the British elite Whitehall does not care about international law or human rights, um, protecting civilians you know in conflict, um, and also illustrative of how the media essentially acts in service of the state, not through any conspiracy or not through any coercion, but simply in the incentives that there are for journalists to cover some stories, but not other stories. So, you know, the, the, the Yemen conflict should really be in people's minds, you know, it should be on the front pages, it should be a leading item in news reports, and it, and it simply isn't. There's been sporadic coverage of, of, of the Yemen war, some people will know about it, but many people don't even know it's going on, and, and they certainly don't know what role Britain plays in it. If you do a Google search for Britain's role, Britain's war in Yemen, you won't find more than one or one or two um, one or two articles. That's crazy. So it's been cut. It's been covered up essentially. And it, there, there are there are several other conflicts that I could mention. I mean, for example, one of the one of the conflicts that m- many people know about is between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very, very controversial conflict. Um, but what's clear is that the, the, the British are arming Israel. Um, they've been apologizing for is, Israeli human rights abuses. They've, they've defended Israel against being brought before the International Criminal Court. Um, and all of this is taking place without any, again, without any significant media coverage of Britain's exact relationship to Israel, the fact that it is supporting. Israel militarily. There's a secret military agreement that the UK has with the Israelis. It's never been made public. Uh, the media has never even mentioned it, actually, as far as I'm aware. Uh, we, we don't know what's in that agreement, but, but 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 what we do know is that there's military training going on. That again, there's advice, there's arms exports, and so on. So uh, the, the, those two conflicts are, I think, critical ones to be aware of. At the moment, and if, you know, if you were to go back historically, there, there are thirty episodes that you know could talk about off the top of my head that probably the British public has never been told about, even when it comes to uh, you know what Britain has been up to. And they, these things are largely kept from us. And you, 
Um, and I, I see I see my role and I see Declassified's role as bringing these things to light so that governments, we can see what governments have been doing in our name. It's so important, the work that you do. It's absolutely brilliant. And when I read Web of Deceit as a much younger man, it had a really profound, lasting effect on me, actually, which, which I still feel to this day. I mean, when I, when I read it, I felt that I was quite enlightened and tuned in. You know, I was a cynical old lefty and, you know, the, the idea that the government couldn't be trusted and lied to us and was involved in covert operations around the world was not entirely new or controversial to me. But when I read Web of Deceit, I just had no idea the scale and the depth of it and how far back this goes as well. So again, for those people who are getting this for the first time, would it be possible to now discuss some of the historical stuff, much of which is mentioned in Web of Deceit? Um, but would it be, I'm not, I know you said that you could, um, you could mention 30 examples, and I'm not going to ask you to name all, all 30 of them, but um, if we could go over some of the, um, the, the more important ones that illustrate further your point about Britain's um, collusion with tyranny and rogue states and terror states around the world. Well, first, thanks, James, for your, your comments about Web of Deceit. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I wrote that book as a kind of stream of consciousness ne nearly 20 years ago now, where I tried to, to bring together what I thought was the reality of Britain's foreign policy by going back and looking at the, the declassified files and then trying to bring it all together in a, in a popular book, you know, that could be uh, understood by, by everyone, not, you know, not, not specialists, not, it wasn't aimed at specialists, it was aimed at um, everyone. To, to be able to understand, you know, their, their, their country's role in the world. I mean, I, I think there are several themes. I mean, one is that, you know, Britain is a, a regular supporter of repressive regimes. Uh, there's no real intrinsic interest in human rights or, or international law uh, in Whitehall. The, these, these are concepts which are used to, to challenge enemy states. Um, so, for example, you know, you can go back to the go back to the 1950s. Look at the the UK's role in the overthrow of the Iranian democratically elected government in 1953. The overthrow of uh, Indonesia's popular nationalist government in in 1957. The support for the overthrow of the Chilean leader Salvador Allende in in 1973. Um, you can look at the brutal British wars in Kenya in the 1950s and, and in Malaya in the 1950s. In, in, in Kenya, Britain was putting hundreds of thousands of people in concentration camps and allowing tens of thousands of people to die of starvation. In Malaya, we, we were mass bombing um, the Malayan countryside and actually using precursors of Agent Orange that was used in uh, Vietnam by the Americans to defoliate um, huge areas of the Malayan countryside in order to, uh, in order to attack the rebels who, who were fighting a, a British-backed government. You know, in the, in the 60s, we, we depopulated the Chagos Islands yeah. in, the, in the Indian Ocean. Um, we, we supported, I say we, I mean, it's wrong to say we. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, this is, this is the British elite. Uh, they're, 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 they're unaccountable. They have nothing to do with me as a British citizen. Um, that they, uh, you know, they, they in the 1960s did, did various things. I mean, let, let me just let me just try and summarise a couple of a couple of episodes. So, you know, both Conservative and Labour governments supported the US attacks on Vietnam throughout the 1960s. You know, the mass bombing, the mass terror bombing of Vietnam for years, but basically supported by the US, with, by, by the UK, within limits, not not total support. But there were there were there were covert operations that the British played. Um, we 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 backed the 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 U.S. war there, which was one of the most devastating conflicts in in human history. The Labour government, uh, towards the end of the 1960s, and I, I want to emphasise Labour government because yeah. Labour has been just as bad as the Conservatives over the decades. The Labour government of the 1960s supported one of the world's worst atrocities in Indonesia in 1965, when the Indonesian regime murdered. 800,000 people uh, in a massive up pogrom against the, the uh, and, and any other leftists that got caught up in their, in their uh, what was really a mass murder campaign to, to, um, to 
bring about so-called stability in the country. Britain supported the Nigerian war against Biafra in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, which was actually the, the kind of the, the 1960s equivalent of the Yemen war. It's the worst humanitarian atrocity um, of that time, in the late 1960s, when millions of Biafrans actually died as a, re as a result of a brutal war being waged by the government in, in Nigeria against the secessionist region of Biafra. And Britain secretly armed the Nigerians as they were doing that and enabled them to, to, uh, to undertake the, 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 the atrocities that they carried out and enabled them to, um, to, to, to um, stop the Biafran secessionist um, claims. One of the most horrendous wars in history. And all, all these episodes, and I, I could carry on, but I mean, you know, all, all these episodes have basically been written out of history if they if they were ever in it. So, for example, if you if you read about the UK's role in the Vietnam War, for example, if you check media reports on that, the, the one thing that you'll read is that Britain refused to send troops to Vietnam to support the US, and that's true. Actually, the Wilson government did refuse. Um, the um, U.S. requests to support um, the U.S. more than they were doing at the time. But Britain did everything else to support the United States, as uh, the declassified files show. So it's been covered up. You know, the extent of the U.K. support for the violence that the U.S. meted out during the Vietnam War has basically been kept from the, from the British public. These are just some of the episodes in the, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, carry on into the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and up until now. And it's not, it's not necessarily the case. And I'm not, I'm not saying that absolutely everything that Britain does in the world falls into these categories of promoting coups and supporting human rights abuses and backing repressive states and violating international law. I'm not for one moment saying that that describes absolutely everything that Britain does. But these are permanent features of the UK's foreign policy. And, and they're, they're key features, and, and they are ones which are largely, as I say, kept from public understanding in favour of this view that we are the good guys, you know, that we are the supporters of human rights and of peace and of democracy. Uh, and, and, it, you know, and, and that vision, that, that view is plainly not true. Oh man, it's fucked up, isn't it? And it 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 leads one to question, and it, this may sound very naive, um, but I think it would be interesting to explore this. It's a very simple question, and that is why? Why does this little island have a need to do this? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's actually quite clear um, at a, at a very sort of top line general level. It's some 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 things come through very clearly from the declassified files. You know, when when you read what officials, ministers really want. You know, when, when you read those files and when, when they spell out what they're trying to achieve in particular places around the world at particular times, it becomes very clear what they want. And I, I think there's two overall goals that the British elite have in the world. One, one is to ensure that the Western, the, the, the overall global economy functions in the interest of Western corporations so that our multinational corporations benefit from access to and control over key resources in the world, in particularly including oil in the post-1945 period and other mineral resources, other key sort of strategic minerals useful for industrial society. And, and, and that means to ensure that the world is safe for Western corporations. So to have governments around the world that are promoting pro pro-Western free market, essentially, um, policies. And in order to achieve that objective, the West, the UK and the US, you often acting in, in, in partnership, will, will do anything. They will, they will overthrow governments. They will, they will um, bring about, try and bring about regimes, governments, who will promote those economic priorities so that Western corporations profit from um, the, the, the economic policies being promoted by those countries. I mean, that in a nutshell is, is one of the key goals. The, the other, so if that's an economic goal, the other goal is a political one where the British elite, which, you know, has been steeped in 
hundreds of years of <laughs> imperial grand grandeur and being the the world's leading power has has wanted since the end of the second world war to to maintain its great power status to be a leading actor in the world it's never wanted to reduce itself to the level of a you know a third rate power like a, say in Italy or a Spain or, or or even a France you know it, it it's wanted to be a a great power um and that meant in 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 the early post war world it meant allying the the UK to the US you know the world superpower and for the for the UK to become a kind of a l- lieutenant to american power around the world so that by latching on to the us and as, as a real special relationship that would maintain britain's great power status so that we would have this continue to have this ability to influence the world and actually to rule to rule the world along with the us essentially acting as the us's lieutenant um and various various policies have been put in place to try and maintain that political influence I, i think if you if you go back to why britain acquired nuclear weapons in the 1940s and why we still have nuclear weapons i think a large reason for that from the from the evidence is is for for political purposes that it enables britain to be one of the sort of top flight nations um that has stupendous military power which also translates into its political influence um so british elites have wanted to to maintain that political influence and to be you know a major political actor in the world and and i think it's a combination of those that that fundamental economic goal and that fundamental political goal that that's what british elites want and i think the key question for us as as citizens is you know to what extent do those things act in in our interests you know as, as british citizens <laughs> because this is what the elites want but how do, how do we benefit from that and as britons and then you know what impact does this have on the rest of the world and i would say that the the impact on the rest of the world is 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 often extremely negative from from these twin goals that the, the british have and and also it, the, the, the these goals do not act in our interest either we we might be paying for them you know paying for them with our money as taxpayers but we're not really benefiting from them because i think the uk makes the world you know on balance a more dangerous place and i think you know we've contributed to some of the worst things that have happened in the world and that's why we need to transform the way that the uk acts in the world and that's why we need to transform the way that we're governed as well so that so that we have different priorities as a nation state operating in the world it's interesting that you you did you describe it as britain's unique place in the world as America's lieutenant. I mean, we're often um, described as America's lapdog in the world, but is it a uniquely British thing or is it typical of, you know, could we pick any former colonial, you know, North European power like France or Spain or Italy? I mean, could we have the same conversations about them with the same be true or is it, as you say, a specifically and uniquely British thing? No, I think the, 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 the special relationship um with the, the UK has with the US it is very different actually than than the the relationship that other states have with the US i mean it's certainly true that other states are also pretty lapdogish you know there's a lot of countries in the world that say that their their primary ally is the US you know whether that is you know, germany might say that um norway might actually say that even you you might be surprised to know um but the 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 specific role that britain plays in alliance with the us it, it is very unique i mean essentially what the what the british role is it's a military role and an intelligence role that um britain you know has often done the dirty work of the us you know we we send in the sas or we send in some other covert troops um to do stuff on the ground that often the us is not able to do because they have better oversight laws among you know in the us congress um you know that's happened in places like afghanistan um o- over the years so you know you you were a very secretive um state i would say authoritarian in some ways where the you know, the accountability of our elites is less than even in the us so the, the british military can get away with sending its covert forces across across the world to do the dirty work for the us where whereas the, the us might find it difficult to do that itself 
the the other the other key role that the, the British play alongside the US is is in an intelligence role that um, the GCHQ MI6 are particularly plugged in to the the US intelligence system and they often work together and pass on joint intelligence in in wars or, or in peacetime to the joint spying operations. And um, the U.S., I think, can heavily rely on those U.S. intelligence assets um, to, um, to, to, to get information, to find intelligence on, in areas of the world where the U.S. has less of a presence, but where the U.K. does have a presence. So some of the ex-colonies, for example, in Africa, some places in the Middle East, like the Gulf states, where Britain has really key special relationships. The British intelligence network might well be better there than the U.S. intelligence network. So um, you can, you know, there, there can be a special relationship there as well. The, the, the other role there's probably a third role, third special role that the U.K. plays, and that is a, as a diplomatic supporter of U.S. aggression. You know, when, whenever the U.S. invades anywhere, it's, it's always Britain that either plays the, the sub role or that apologizes for it and explains it and justifies it at the United Nations. I mean, that, that's, that's gone on for, for decades, you know, whether we go back to Iraq in 2003 or other conflicts. It's, it's all, you know, Whitehall will be the, the attack dog, if you like, the diplomatic supporter of, of U.S. aggression. There's almost no cases in history where where the UK will publicly condemn anything that the, that the US does. I mean, you can count the, the times um, in terms of US interventions, coups or wars, you can count the time, the number of times when the US, the UK is prepared to criticize those in public on the fingers of one hand. You know, the, the UK will, will support and justify US actions around the world. So there is a special relationship, and it's got to do with that diplomacy, that intelligence um, support, and, and and the military support. And I think that combination of things is slight is different than 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 any other country. That's so interesting. I mean, taking putting the special relationship aside, I'm assuming that every former colonial power still has its tentacles around the world and its vested interests and its relationships with various dictatorships that support its domestic, you know, business interests or whatever. But it's the level at which the other countries are involved in these types of activities around the world comparable in any way at all to what Britain does, or are we just on a scale that is has has no match basically? Well, France, I mean, France is the, the immediately comparable European country to Britain in terms of its, you know, the range of its sort of skullduggery, if you like, and support for human rights abusing regimes, particularly its role in, you know, Francophone Africa, obviously. But France doesn't have anything like a special relationship with the US that, that Britain has. You know, France has always played a more sort of independent, more of a nationalist role vis-a-vis the, the, the US over the decades. That's been its sort of unique selling point, if you like, in international affairs, whereas Britain is completely thrown in its lot, pretty much, with, with the US and is happy to act as its as its lieutenant. Probably the, the only other, the, the, sort of the, 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 maybe the major comparison with the US might well be, um, with the UK, might well be Australia in terms of um, a kind of a lapdogish role that Australia sometimes provides um, in, in terms of an intelligence and military role alongside the, the US. Um, but Australia is quite limited in its sort of global reach, um, whereas, whereas Britain tends to have um, you know, a much larger reach in Africa and the Middle East and Asia due to its former empire and its legacy of that. So Britain is a lot more useful to the, to the, to the US than, than any other country, I think. It's a lot of power for a little island, isn't it? It's crazy when you think about it. Yeah, and it's it's not very well understood exactly either how powerful Britain still is. I mean, we, we can exaggerate this, definitely. But, for example, we at Declassified did a um, piece of research recently. It's led by my colleague at Declassified, Phil Miller. And we established that Britain has over 140 military bases around the world in over 40 countries. Now, these aren't necessarily giant bases. Some of them are quite small with two or three military personnel in them. Some of them are much larger with several dozen. But 140 bases in over 40 countries that the the British military actually has is quite significant. I mean, it shows 
it, it, sh it shows something about Britain's sort of global reach. In, in a lot of surveys that have been done, Britain still comes out as one of the most influential countries in, in the world in terms of its foreign policy, in terms of the combination of its military power, its diplomatic power, its, its intelligence connections. Um, I mean, if you can you compare Britain with China, for example, I mean, China has virtually no, I think it, China has one overseas military base um, in the Middle East. Uh, that, that compares to Britain having 140. You know, China is a country with a, a billion people and we're meant to be fearing China now and how it's going to take over the world. I mean, obviously, what British elites fear is that the, the age of Western global supremacy is coming to an end, and, and, and it's the Chinese that are going to take over from us. Um, but, you know, China is a relatively small player compared to, compared to the UK. You know, a, 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 as British citizens, we, we should be questioning what our own country is doing around the world and really understanding much more about what its, what its role actually is. And I, I fear that's that's something which we, we don't understand enough uh, about. We don't understand it historically, and, and, and we don't even understand it now. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the rise of China, because I, I'm really interested in that myself as to how that's going to play out, because you know many people think that we're entering the end of the Western dominance of the world. And uh, you know we're, we're seeing the beginnings of the, um, the rise of the East. But I had Greg Pallast on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he disagrees with that. He said that if you look at what's happening in China and India, they're actually Westernizing. Their, 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 their growth in power and influence around the world is actually as an effect of them becoming these huge capitalist economies and their tentacles are spreading around the world through that old mechanism. So he thinks that the, the Western rule of things around the world is actually doing very well and is actually supported even further by the rise of China and India. Yeah, I think that's true to an extent. But I, 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 I yeah, and, 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 and Greg Pallas is a great, great journalist and someone I really respect. Um, I think that what British elites fear, though, is that that, that a, a growing, a militarily growing China, if if that's how it transpires, will challenge Anglo-American power in in the world, and it and it's growing economic power in places like Africa, which has traditionally been a British preserve, um, will you know will will bring up the death throes of the Britain's great power kind of role that we've played for hundreds of years. I, I do think elites are really concerned about that. And I actually think this might also have a, quite a lot to do with the policy towards Russia at the moment, that wanting to isolate, demonize Russia um, in order to remove it as a, as a challenger to, to Western power. You know, we have to remember, I mean, this is one of the things that comes through, again, in these declassified files that I, that I keep mentioning. The, it, elites really do think, see things on a chessboard. You know, they, 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 they really are concerned with geopolitics, about, you know, the, this country rising in power, threatening us, that country rising in power, threatening us. That's, that's really how they do think. That's how they've thought for hundreds of years. You know, it's the, the sort of the great game played out on, on the global map. And they and you know they are concerned about the rise of China. They are concerned about um, an, an independent Russia. And traditionally, the biggest threats to to Western power have been independent nationalist regimes that that don't do the West's bidding. You know, they 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 challenge those economic policies that I was mentioning earlier that the West wants to promote in the world. You know, they have other ideas about. Um, maybe nationalizing their, their strategic resources or not wanting to trade freely with the West, not wanting to invite Western multinationals into their economies. You know, one, once countries adopt, countries and governments adopt those kinds of policies, they, they are regularly seen as enemies of, of the West and then, then they can be ripe to being, for being overthrown. And, and so independent nationalism, governments that cannot be controlled by the West are seen as enemies. And we see that with Russia. We see that with China. It doesn't make them benign. I, I'm no supporter of Putin or of the Xi Jinping regime in China. These are authoritarian regimes, pretty nasty regimes. 
But that's not the reason why they're opposed by the West. The West is happy to deal with all sorts of nasty regimes. The reason why they're, they're, they're challenging Russia and China is because Russia and China are independent regimes that don't do the West bidding. Um, so, and, and that's why I think these things are very dangerous because in, in these calculations, British elites aren't thinking of the national interest. Uh, they're not thinking about the interest of the British public in their policies towards Russia or China. They're thinking about the interests of the elite and wanting to maintain the sort of great power status. And that's, so there's a, there's a massive schism between their interests and, and our interests, in, in my view. How do you see this playing out then over the next few decades? I mean, is it conceivable that there would be a military confrontation between the West and China? And do you, do you see that being a traditional land-based confrontation or nuclear or economic? Or do you think that the powers that be are more likely to avoid that route? Well, I do think there are, there are signs that some things could be pretty dangerous because there clearly is a faction in the US and in the UK and in other parts of the West that, that probably thinks that they should be taking on China earlier rather than later before China becomes an even more important economic and military power in order to stop China becoming a, a more major power. And some of those signs are, you know, this British pivot, so-called pivot towards Asia and sending our warships over to uh, the, the Indian Ocean and into the, into the South China Sea and signing this new agreement with Australia and the US to challenge Chinese power in Asia. And, you know, is this the beginning of a, of a new sort of episode in warmongering where the West is looking for a moment to actually militarily take on China. I mean, because if we're in that sort of area, then things could get very, very dangerous. Um, and that, that, these are clearly things to be very, very concerned about, I think. Um, it seems that over the last 10 years or so, there, there, there's, there's been two factions within, I think, both the US and the, and, and the US the, the US and the UK elite. One, one has been the, the traders with China, the, 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 those people who are arguing that our primary relationship with China should be to trade with them and to promote sort of joint prosperity, if you like, uh, whilst also being very cautious about China because it's a Communist Party state and authoritarian. But then the other faction has been, well, actually, you know, we, we, we should be prepared to compromise on those trade relationships. The real relationship we've got, to be, we've got to have with China is to contain it, even militarily. And it seems that what's happened in the last 10 years is that that, that latter faction has, has won. And now we're in the situation where it's the containment policies and the you know, militarily forward, forward basing policies that are, that are the ones that are dominant. And that, that's, that's dangerous. Um, and and you, you mentioned nuclear wars. I mean, unfortunately, we can't, we certainly can't completely rule out um, the prospect of nuclear wars between the great powers in the coming decades, just like we, we haven't been able to rule that out in, in, in recent decades. And th this is not just a problem with our, you know, the, the official enemies. It's not just a problem with the, the, the Russians and the Chinese. It's, it, it's, it's a question of our policies as well. Most people don't realize that we, we also have first strike nuclear weapons policies. First strike means, you know, being country to first use nuclear weapons. The, the West and Britain has never ruled out being the first country to, to use nuclear weapons. There have been various times in recent decades where Britain has threatened to use nuclear weapons against um, states or has deployed nuclear weapons to conflicts. Um, with a kind of latent threat that they might be used in that conflict. So, you know, we are, our elite, ourselves, need to be reined in when it comes to the prospect of, of the, the, you know, horrendous prospect of, of you know, of potential future nuclear wars. Um, so w whether the next few decades are going to be more dangerous than ones in the past, I mean, not, not necessarily. I mean, we, we, we have been through some very dangerous periods in the last 30, 40 years. I mean, you know, I am old enough to remember the, 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 the Cold War in the 1980s, sort of the, the, 
revamped Second Cold War, as it was called, in the 1980s, when there was a Ronald Reagan in the White House who seemed to be keen to start bombing the Soviet Union. I mean, that, that was a very dangerous period in international relations. We're, we're not in that sort of period yet. But, you know, you only need some real extremists to come into, to come into power in one or two key countries. And, you know, that could change, unfortunately. Man, what times we're living in. And you've mentioned quite a few times now the elites. So just for clarity and to explore that, when you mention when you when you talk about elites, who exactly are you talking about? I mean, this is this is a key question, James, because you know we we are brought up to believe that Britain is a democracy, um, and there are very strong democratic elements to British society. We have elections. We we have protections as as individuals. You know, we 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 have human rights protections. We have freedom of association. We have free speech laws. We have all sorts of things which are, which you would definitely call democratic rights. But at the same time, when it comes to particularly foreign policy making, you know, when it comes to actually how our elites formulate policy. Britain is really not a democratic state. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 my argument is that Britain acts more as an oligarchy, where a small number of people, essentially the permanent government, the, the officials in Whitehall, they're the ones who decide policy. It, it, it's, it's very difficult to influence them. Parliament has very limited influence over the policies of a government. Uh, the public still less. The media rarely seriously exposes what governments are up to in their foreign policies. So this small permanent government of, of, of officials in Whitehall and the ministers who, who control them can, can pretty much do what they like. It's like, you know, Lord Helsham, this sort of law lord in the 1970s called Britain an elective dictatorship. And he wasn't really joking. Um, we did an, an opinion poll actually at Declassified a few months ago asking our supporters, what term would they use to describe the UK? Democracy, managed democracy, oligarchy. Uh, and, and oligarchy was the, was the most popular term. I think they're right. Um, there's, there's an enormous number of ways in which we really cannot influence um, what policymakers do. And, and, and a key aspect of that is just excessive state secrecy. I mean, it, one of our tasks as, as declassified is to try and uncover what policies actually are, you know, because even when MPs ask questions of, of government in, in the House of Commons, the, the answers routinely come back saying, well, we can't answer that because it's longstanding policy not to, not to reveal that. So you can't talk about Britain's special forces, for example. There's a blanket ban on talking about them in Parliament. No, no minister will ever answer a question about Britain's special forces. They might be active in half a dozen countries around the world, but we have no idea what they're doing. Um, there's very limited influence that backbench MPs have over the policies of the state. For example, the, the primary mechanism by which um, government policy is scrutinized is are these all-party parliamentary committees the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Defence Committee of Parliament, which are meant to monitor government policy and are meant to hold the government to account. But if you, if you look at those, um, those committees and what they do, they're toothless. Uh, they, they, they very rarely put the government under any real pressure. They, they very rarely expose what the government is doing. This is the primary mechanism in, in Parliament, or one of the primary mechanisms in Parliament. To, to hold governments to account for their foreign policies, and it simply doesn't work. So there are, there are, whilst there are a lot of democratic elements to our society, there's also a lot of oligarchical elements in terms of how our system works. We, we can see it. You know, you see it now with, with you know, the, the, the cronyism going on in, in government, the handing out of contracts to, to the mates of ministers and the... Um, the impossibility of removing a prime minister who lies all the time. You know, what, why is it we can't, why, why is it that the British political system cannot remove a person who regularly violates the law 
and who lies all the time? Well, the reason is that there are no democratic mechanisms to do that. There are no democratic mechanisms to actually hold a prime minister to account. Britain is, you know, in, in, in its foreign policy, we're, we are routinely violating international laws, routinely contributing to human rights abuses. Ministers cannot be held accountable for those actions by law. There's a thing called crown immunity, which means that if ministers contribute to human rights abuses abroad, they cannot be held accountable for them under because they are immune as a minister of the crown. This is not democratic. You know, this is oligarchic. And I think, I, I personally think that the, 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 the biggest challenge, well, one of the biggest challenges we face is to democratize our, our whole governance system because it, it, it really is, is not democratic, particularly when it comes to, to foreign policy making. And is there an ideological element to this? I mean, I've always been very confused by this because I, I just can't wrap my head around that. I mean, you'd have to be barking mad, wouldn't you? I mean, I, so I've always leaned towards the more cynical analysis that it, this is the motivation for these guys is basically the, the classic lust for more power and wealth and greed and corporate interests and, you know, this, the sort of vested interest to protect the class that they're a part of. But am I wrong? I mean, do these guys still live in the in the 1700s? And does ideology play a part in this at all? Well, I think there's definitely are personal goals that, that some ministers, officials pursue when they're in public office. I mean, for example, the classic thing is kind of the, to do with the revolving door of, um, of personnel between Whitehall and then, say, arms corporations or energy corporations. You know, it's a standard thing is for officials in the Ministry of Defence or ministers in the Ministry of Defence, once they retire or leave office, to take a job in, in some arms corporation and, and earn lots of money, uh, pro- possibly in an arms corporation that they've been promoting while they were an official. Um, if you look at BP and Shell, there's a revolving door between officials and ministers and them as well. Head of MI6 um, is currently on the board of, of um, BP. Um, the, the intelligence community and big um, British corporations, you know, another revolving door. So people definitely do personally profit from, from the system. And some people see it as a, you know, a way of personal, personal aggrandizement, personal profit. And, and this is, you know, it's corruption. At the, at the end of the day, um, it, it, if it happened in Africa, it would be called corruption. And when it happens here, it's just sort of called, well, it's just the white hole system. So, this, so there definitely is personal aggrandizement. But I think there is, there, there is an ideology as well. I, I think anyone that wants to get on in white hole needs to accept certain truths and certain ways of behaving. Um, you need to you need to promote these you need to believe in them you need to promote these objectives of maintaining britain's great power status promoting britain's in you know what's called promoting britain's interests around the world anyone that doesn't fit in to to that is not going to get very far and and there aren't many whistleblowers either you know we we there's a we we um we had declassified recently interviewed a former foreign office lawyer called Molly Mulready, a very brave woman who told us on camera about how casual and jokey Boris Johnson was when he was talking about arms exports to Saudi Arabia being used against civilians in, in Yemen. You know, she, she, is, she is a whistleblower. She, she revealed how the Whitehall system has been arming the, 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 the tyrants in Saudi Arabia and causing human rights abuses in, in Yemen. She's one of, you know, she's she's that 0.0001 percent of the people working in Whitehall who are prepared to to eventually blow the whistle and tell the truth. Um, we do need more people like her actually to to come out of the to come out of the closet and to to speak frankly about what they've seen going on in the inside of of Whitehall. But there's a culture, you know, there's there's a culture there and. Um, the system militates against challenging, you know, against challenging it. 
this is a it's a deeply rooted, embedded ideological system, I think, in Whitehall that has long promoted certain objectives. But we're supposed to have a media whose job it is to hold power to account and keep us all informed of to uh, the skullduggery, as you've described it, that happens in our name and on our purse strings, of course. But as you've alluded many times, they, they don't even acknowledge that these things are happening. So why is that? You know, is it simply as cynical as that they have to basically conform to the wishes of the corporations that pay for their advertising? Or is it because most of the mainstream media outlets are actually owned by people who are part of the very elite that you're talking about? I mean, I I actually think that the media, the British media that we have is probably the single biggest problem that that we face in terms of enabling the British public to understand what Britain's real foreign policy, its real role in the world actually is, because they're really not being told the truth. And this is true of the right-wing billionaire controlled media, and it's also true of the liberal media, you know, the Guardians and the Independents and the BBC. So they're, 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 they're as bad as each other. And 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 the, the reason for it is is not, you know, there's no 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 one is telling journalists what to write or what not to write. There's there's just an incentive system once you become a journalist in in the mainstream. You 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 soon learn what you can write about and what you can't write about. All the incentives are to to write stuff that um, en- enables you to continue to have access to the powers that be, um, to get the quotes from them, to get the stories from them, but not to upset the apple cart too much. I mean, in a way, it's it's not unlike any other system. I mean, anyone going to work in an office for a corporation, any, everyone ultimately gets to understand what are the red lines, the things that you can get away with, the things you can't get away with as, as, as an individual. And after a while, you begin to self-censor. You begin to, you, you begin to say, well, I, I shouldn't really write that because I know that if I write that, then you know, the editor might not like it or the Ministry of Defence might not like it. And, and therefore, it's safer to do something else. The, the way that the UK media works is that it... it I mean, you can say anything you like about our enemies. You know, you can you can say that Vladimir Putin eats babies and locks up his children at night and, you know, and, and whips them to in, until they're half dead. You could probably, if you wanted to write that, you could probably get it published in, you know, in the Times or something. But if you try and if you try and uncover stuff that's actually factual about what our our um, allies are doing or what we are doing then it becomes much more difficult to get that published. Um, the other thing is that you know, most people don't realise that um, most of what we read in the British media when it comes to Britain's military policies abroad or Britain's foreign policies abroad, most of that actually comes from the Ministry of Defence or the Foreign Office. You know, a lot of it comes from straight press releases that have been handed out to journalists from those government departments, that then journalists write up as news um, and then present it as a news story. So it, it, the, the viewpoints of ministers, the viewpoints of the state, it very easily dominate the news coverage. Um, we, I, I at Declassified and we at Declassified have done analysis of Sky News, BBC, and the print media in the UK, trying to look at, well, I mean, how do they cover Britain's foreign policy? And the, the, the analysis is always the same. There, there are a few articles that you could say are genuinely critical that are revealing certain things. But, but most articles are firmly within the framework that ministers are completely happy with. So, you know, declassified, we've written 300 or so articles now that reveal all sorts of things about Britain's role in the world. We simply could not get published in the, in the mainstream media because it wouldn't be prepared to, 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 to take that kind of material. Um, the, the frustrating thing is that the public generally, I don't think, really understands the degree to which they are being misinformed and sometimes disinformed by the papers that they're reading and the television that they're watching. You know, I, I know that trust in the media is an all-time low. The opinion polls seem to say that. So people are cynical 
about the media. But I don't think that people buying the Times, buying the Guardian, they don't, they don't quite understand the extent to which they're not being told the truth in, 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 um, in, in what they're reading. And, and this is a key task, I think, of declassified. We're trying to we're trying to raise public awareness about how the, the mainstream media actually works. Um, and I hope that you know by by people looking at our articles and our investigations and then comparing what we're doing to what the the rest of the media is doing, I hope that they will see what you know what that difference is. That you can learn a, f- a lot more by reading our stuff than by by you know watching the television or reading the papers. Oh, one hundred percent. I mean, the site. Let's let's give it a quick plug whilst we're on the topic, and we'll you know we'll plug it later and link it in as well. But the site that Mark is describing is declassifiedukorg and it is absolutely incredible. I would recommend everybody go there as soon as we finish the listening to the podcast now and check out an absolute gold mine of information and articles and evidence and content of the very nature that Mark has been talking about throughout this chat so far. The site contains a real treasure trove of information that's such an asset to all of us, thanks to the years of tireless work by Mark and many other journalists. So I'd 100% recommend everybody get digging through that site and save it as a favourite straight away. But would you be able to give a shout out to some other alternative news sources that people can go to as well for good, reliable news, uh, you know, to do with daily affairs as well? Because a lot of people have, have recommended the Bylines Times as being a particularly credible and reliable source. Uh, is that something you would go to or are there other places as well that you could mention uh, that people can go and check out rather than the fucking same old Guardian and Daily Mail and you know, all the others? Well, thanks, first of all, for what you're saying about declassified. I, I appreciate that. I mean, we have had lots of good feedback from the people that do know our, our, our site. And so clearly we're, we're performing a, you know, a good function for, for increasing numbers of people. So, I, you know, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, over the last 10 years, there has been a burgeoning of, of independent media organizations, which I think is a very positive thing. I mean, I actually saw a, a, a poll the other day saying that something like 30% of people are now getting their primary news source from, from social media. Now, I know that that can be a hazard in some cases because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of fake news on social media. Um, there's a, so, we, you know, we need to be careful about relying on social media. But there's also a lot of very good stuff on social media. We, we use Twitter uh, a lot as our, as our messaging platform, as a, as a platform to, to publicize our, our articles. And a lot of other independent media groups do. And it's very encouraging to see people, I think, increasingly moving away from um, national newspapers and mainstream television into, looking at, uh, into consulting more independent media. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some very good organizations out there. They're, they're often, I mean, like us, very, very small. So they tend to be niche. There's, a, there's an organization called The Ferret in Scotland, which does very good investigations into things, things to do with Scotland. Uh, you know, it's independent, run by its, its members, publicly, so, you know, publicly funded and, you know, very good. Um, I, I mentioned them. They're, they're just one example. I mean, you know, there, there are there are plenty of others. I mean, there's organisations like Navara Media, there's the Canary, there's Squawk Box. There, you mentioned Byline Times. They they do some good work. Every all all of all of these organisations, they they um, they're covering things in a different in a different way than the mainstream. They all have a slightly different different niche, maybe a slightly different ideological take. But the most important thing is that is to have a pluralist media I think, where people have a choice about where to go for information rather than a country relying on a small number of corporate media outlets that have vast influence. You know, millions of people reading the Daily Mail, millions of people reading The Guardian, thinking that they're being told the truth. Whereas what we need is a much more pluralist media landscape where people could go in search of evidence and compare and contrast, if you like, between different media outlets rather than relying for rather than relying on a single source or one or two sources for for all of their information. I think that's that's the that's the the challenge that we have is to build up the independent media sector. And I think actually that can only be done by us as a public because 
there are very few funders of independent media. Corporations aren't going to do it. Um, we, we rely on members of the public, main, mainly alongside a small number of trusts and foundations, independent trusts who fund us. But we're, we're very small. We're minnows, you know, in the, in the media landscape. I mean, our, our revenues are 1,216 times less than The Guardian's. You know, The Guardian is a mega corporation. It's a 200 million pound corporation. Um, we're, we're a very small organization run on a couple of hundred thousand pounds a year. I, but I think that we, we at Declassified, demonstrate what can be done with a few, a few people determined to tell the truth. We, you know, we can actually achieve that. We can do that. We can perform that public interest. And I hope that increasing members of the public will, will you know, come in and support us and support other independent media because that funding will only come from us, I think, ultimately. And, I, you know, I, I look forward to the day when it's independent media who, who dominate the media landscape in the UK, not, not the establishment corporate media. I think we are moving in that, in that direction and it's quite encouraging. Yeah, that's heartening to hear. And it's encouraging that there are more options now because it is very easy to get frustrated and bleaked out by this stuff, you know, and for good reason. Um, you also mentioned that Declassified is directly supported by its readership. So what sorts of things can people do to support and enable you guys to continue the brilliant work that you all do there at Declassified? What can people do? Well, we have... Um a, a membership scheme where people can join Declassified for a very small amount of money. I mean, actually, two pounds a month is our uh, first rung of our membership scheme. Um, and we, we set that deliberately low because we know that times are hard. You know, it's a period of austerity. But the people also do want to fund organizations like us. You know, the, a lot of people are, are passionate about wanting to support people that challenge the establishment and reveal what the establishment are doing. So people can people can join Declassified as a member, as I say, from two pounds a month, five pounds a month, ten pounds a month, whatever people want to provide. Um, the membership scheme also includes some merchandise, you know, t-shirts and mugs and that sort of thing, which you can you can also get. Um, um, but most people support us because they you know because they want to support us, and for us it's a lifeline. I mean, they they are the ones who enable us to do what we what we do and it literally is the case that if ordinary people and i am i am an ordinary person <laughs> if we ourselves don't fund media to act in our interest no one else is going to do that you know it, it is up to us to fund our media system to inform us what our, our governments and what our elites are doing because we're not going to find out through the mainstream information system, the core that we that we currently have. So, I, I, yeah, I mean, I would like to make a plea to people to support Declassified. Um, it, it would be tremendously useful for us, and I think you know you, you're contributing to a new media landscape in the UK, which is our, which should be our joint goal. I think. Well, I'm going to sign up straight away, and I'm going to buy a damn T-shirt as well. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks very much. <laughs> so everybody listening to this, rush out, subscribe to Declassified, and buy a damn T-shirt. I'm also going to plug the books one more time as well, because I cannot recommend these books enough. Honestly, they, they sound heavy going, I know, and they are in content, but they're so well written and easily digestible. Uh, you will not regret it, honestly. An absolute life-changing, mind-blowing necessity, I would say. The three books, um, the most famous books of Marx are Web of Deceit, Unpeople, and Secret Affairs. Is there, um, is there going to be a fourth coming, Mark? Unfortunately, I don't have the time at the moment. I'm, you know, it's declassified is such a full time job. You know, we're we're we're, we're working 120 percent, no capacity to write a book at the moment. I'm afraid. Oh, I hear you, man. I'm I'm dragging my heels right in my second book, and my my first book was uh, was just all about myself. So <laughs> that should have been easy enough. So uh, I I wouldn't last two minutes doing the sort of work that you do and, and finding some way to condense all of that into a book. Um, but the three I just mentioned should be more than enough, I think, for anyone to check out. And uh, just before you go, because I know that we're going over time now, and, and I know you're super busy, uh, I just wanted to ask you um, one final question: Is having heard everything you've had to say today? What can we do? 
I know it begins and ends with information, and we've thankfully we've got people such as yourself for that. So the first thing we can do is to educate ourselves and take a deep dive into the information that is available. The second thing we can do is to support these media outlets, these alternative sources of information who are oftentimes surviving on a shoestring and contain some of the best and brilliant journalists of our times. But beyond that, once we're armed with the knowledge, what can we actually do to stop this? I mean, I think there are a number of things that people can do and, and uh, you know, many people are, are already doing, actually. Um, you know, one thing to go back to what we were just talking about is I, I do think we need to um, massively increase the reach of independent media because people are not being told the truth. And if people are not being told the truth about what's being done in their name, they can't really be expected to act on it. Um, so there's there's a need to inform people accurately what's going on, um, and 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 that's something which I think ordinary people need need to do need to help fund independent groups, independent media outlets, in order to provide a public service so that we do reveal and challenge what governments are doing. So I think that's the first step in in anything. <clears throat> I think the other thing that people can do is they can, you know, they can support campaign groups who are challenging government policies on, on various things, whether that's, you know, on foreign policies or on, you know, domestic governance issues or on human rights or on the environment. You know, there, there are lots of campaign groups that, that, that exist that people can support. Many of them do really, really good work. I think that the fact that they operate outside the mainstream political system is really important because I don't see very much progressive change coming from within the mainstream political system. Um, Labour, in certain, certain, in, certainly in terms of foreign policy, are no better than the Conservatives. So I don't really see where the prospects for progressive change are going to come from within the mainstream political system. So we have to we have to change that mainstream political system. We have to, you know, people there has to be an activist challenge to, to our system and to transform it. And I, and I think that the, the one area that campaign groups need to come together on, possibly with independent media groups like, like ours, is to democratise this country, is to actually to have a much bigger campaign to transform our largely oligarchical governance system into, into a democratic one. I, I would like to see campaign groups and people coming together in order to do that, because I think this is something that is clearly in, in everyone's interest, apart from the elite. But it's in 98% of the country's interest to have a more democratic system. So I think that uh, you know, supporting campaign groups uh, and media groups pushing in that direction um, is, is really, really important. So I, I'd, I'd say those are the, some of the things that people can do, at least. Uh, that's really useful information. And to have that from just someone like yourself who's been studying this stuff in depth for such a long period of time, that really carries a lot of weight. There are plenty of campaigns out there for people to get involved with. We're going to be having many of them on the podcast. One of my favorites is Extinction Rebellion. And what I know from being around those guys is that change is possible. And the, the numbers are out there. And it's the best feeling in the world when you are a part of something that you know is in line with your core values and you are part of the right side of history. So if you've been moved by what Mark is talking about today, please do dig further into this stuff and please do find causes and campaigns that you can put your weight behind that is going to help us move into a different era of the way politics are done in this country and the interests of which people our power is exercised. But on that note, Mark, I'm going to go and douse myself in caffeine now and, uh, and go and trawl back through all of that incredible info. Thank you so much for your time, man. This has been amazing to have a sit down chat with you and ask you, you know, all the questions that I wanted to ask. I know this is going to be super interesting and insightful information for my listeners. So on behalf of all of us, thanks, man, for everything you do. Long may you continue to do it. And it's been a real pleasure to, to speak with you today. I really appreciate you giving us your time. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, man. And we'd love to have you back at any time. So best, best wishes. We'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Mark. Thanks a lot. See you, James. Bye. Mark Curtis, baby. What did you make of that? Did I, was I a little bit too excitable? Was I dominating too much? Was I getting a little bit too carried away with, you know, trying to chip in my own, <laughs> trying to kind of like act like I was an equal or something like that? I hope not. 
I do get a little bit Taylor Swift fan when I'm around some of these guys that have just got these great minds and these great bodies of work, discovering secret truths and bringing them to the masses, you know what I mean? But yeah, I'm just going to say it one last time. Do go and check out declassifieduk.org and all of Mark's books are absolutely incredible. I cannot recommend them enough. And one final nag before I go, because I am really tired now. I do find talking to these guys quite tiring, man, because like I got to try and keep up to their level and respond and, and keep the thing moving, you know? So um, I'm going to have to start bringing more caffeine onto the podcast, I think. Um, but before I go, I'm going to nag you one more time. Please subscribe, tell your friends. There's some important info being dropped on these shows, man. People need to know about it. So, I, you know, there's only so much I can do. So tell your friends, get the word out there, subscribe. It really helps the podcast. Like, comment, share, you know, put your thoughts in the comments. People message me stuff, but, you know, you put it in the comment. Put it in, put it in part of the public forum for other people to, to see that other people agree with this stuff or, or disagree and have a debate and a conversation. But um, interact, man. This, this is freely, publicly available stuff so it's yours to do with whatever you like so subscribe share spread the word and let's get this out there because next week guess what even more awesome guests can you believe it they just keep coming man so I really hope you're enjoying everything that you've been listening to so far. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I am a little bit brain fried now so I'm gonna go and get myself a coffee and listen back through all that gorgeous info. So wherever you are whatever you're doing whatever time it is there have an awesome week. I love you loads and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.